It's nice to ha not have blistering cold air coming in through the doors these days. I don't see too many people shivering over there next to the doors. You're getting your vitamin D outside. Uh, along those lines, I'll just let you know, so we are aiming to, Lord willing, weather permitting, be outside for Easter. Actually, we're, we're aiming to be outside next week for our service to give a kind of a test run before Easter. Uh, and the main reason for that is just because we want to, Easter to be a day where as many people as possible can possibly come and enjoy worship of Lord without fear of, you know, anything or whatever. So we want to do it in the safest place possible. So we're going to be outside. Safe place. If you want to invite a neighbor, friend, uh, bring them along. Uh, those of you at home, I hope you'll prayerfully consider uh, whether it's a uh, safe uh, ability to come out and worship with us at Easter. Uh, you can sit in your cars. You can be on, you know, in the side parking lot, wherever. Where, just come on out and be with your brothers and sisters on Easter. And uh, yeah, I think it'll be good. So I encourage you to do that. Um, Another just quick word of encouragement before we dive into the sermon today. Uh, I just have, I was just on the mind a little bit this week and partly in conversation and prayer and just, you know, in the news. Just uh, my heart is with, you know, just some of the Asian members of our family uh, these days. You know, it's a strange time where, you know, we're hearing more than, well, more than we want to, you know, news of people with fearful, malicious, Perhaps racist and tense, uh, just doing uh, you know, just hor horrible things to uh, you know people in the, in the Asian community these days. And so, and, and having talked to some of you like uh, this past week, even just having mentioned that, you know, as you go outside, there is just in the thought in your mind, right, that well should be safe, but there there just possibly might be somebody out there who's ignorant and fearful and angry and has racist and tense and might even, and might be violent and. Uh, I certainly don't know what that feels like, uh, but my heart is, is with you all uh, in that. We're praying for you. We love you. And uh, yeah, I just kind of hope that this morning uh, you can just find respite in the, as we worship Christ, who is the King of Kings, uh, the, for, who himself understood scorn, ridicule, hatred, and persecution, uh, and did all that in love uh, for, for us. So, yeah. All right, so there you go. Um, and you could say maybe the sermon this morning has a little bit uh, of that as part of the intention this morning uh, to talk about Jesus as one who provides respite and care and love and comfort to weary, frustrated, jaded, just people, individuals. Right? That's part of my intention uh, this morning. The other intention... Uh, is to talk about what it means to be a church that uh, gives witness to who Christ is, right? Who embodies Christ, who demonstrates Christ, who puts Christ into practice in a very visible way for a world, for a community that is weary, that is jaded, that is frustrating, frustrated. And, and part of that, why I'm saying that, I have a little bit on my mind, you know, this morning, something... We all hear these days, or maybe you all hear, I don't know, I'm hearing it, that, okay, more and more, we are becoming a nation of cynics. Uh, we're jaded. We are untrusting of anything and everyone, right? Some sense we've known this for a while, right? I don't know who is left that trust that our government is going to rise above partisan politics, or rise above you know, corporate lobby interests, you know, or whatever, and just make wise and fruitful decisions for the people that they're called to serve. We're jaded and we're cynical towards media, the media, right? Gone are the days where you would sit at home and watch Walter Cronkite or me when I was growing up, Peter Jennings, and just trust that you're getting undiluted news, right? We, we're jaded. We have a cynical eye, untrustworthy eye, that we're getting news with a bent, and news with an agenda, we look even at the scientific or medical community after 2020 with a little bit of a jaded and cynical eye, right? Are we getting the, you know, the, the latest information, you know, the appropriate true information or, you know, or is the information that's coming out, you know, is it jaded with political agendas or, you know, the actions that, right? You've heard those questions. We're 
cynical and untrusting of financial institutions or community organizations. We're even cynical and jaded towards, as a, as a nation towards one another. Especially in the younger generations. I think a, a recent Pew research study said that young people, or any, uh, young adults under the age of 30, 75% of them say that people more often than not are only concerned about themselves and other people and actually said that if given the opportunity, they would take advantage of you to advantage themselves if they could. 75%, right? And of course, that presents a whole lot of issues and struggles. How does a society survive when we don't trust one another and we don't trust our institutions? But actually, what I'm most concerned about, and I think we all ought to be most concerned about, is you would think, okay, what they would at least look to the church, the church that is called to give witness to Jesus and to worship Jesus and to testify to Jesus and embody Jesus in the neighborhood, that they would look to the church, see Jesus, and find there a respite for their weary, jaded souls. But <laughs> the church, too. It's just another one of those institutions in their eyes that they look at very cynically, especially, again, the younger generations, you millennials and Gen Zers, right, are in droves, just being very cynical towards the church. Right or wrong, young people, they look at the church, and they see scandals in the news, and they, worse than that, they see cover-up of scandals. Or right or wrong, you know, the younger generations are looking at the church and they're seeing uh, infatuation with power or alignment with political parties. They're looking to the church, right or wrong, and they're seeing a greater concern to stand up for agendas and interests and uh, a life that they want to preserve for themselves instead of standing alongside those who are weary and suffering and hurting and poor. Uh. Or, or again, right or wrong, they're looking to the church and they're just not seeing Jesus. And so the question that I have is like, how do we, how do we preserve that witness and testimony? It was Russell Moore. Um, he's one of the ethicists for the Southern Baptist uh, Convention. He says, the biggest threat facing the American church right now, it's not secularism, it's cynicism. He says, that's why we have to recover the credibility of our witness. It's one thing to dismiss the teachings of the faith as strange and unlikely, he says, but if people walk away from the church because they don't believe we really believe what we say, well, that's a crisis. He says there's an entire generation of people who are growing cynical that religion is just another means to some other end. Right? Entire generation of people that lumps us in with all the other cultural institutions and say, yeah, they're just serving a higher agenda, higher interest. And so I'm interested in those two things this morning. What is it how is Jesus a respite for a weary, frustrating, jaded, cynical world? And how is, as a church, do we preserve or reinvigorate what we're called to do? Be a testimony. Be the embodiment of this Jesus to a jaded, weary world. And actually try to save the soul of a generation that doesn't see that right now. Uh, and of course, all of us, I'm interested in, in, in asking the question, how, does, how in the world does our text lead us there this morning? <laughs> Right? Uh, basically, as I look at this text, I look at it as a contrast between two individuals, David and Saul. We've kind of been in that contrast for a little while. But I'm looking at it as a contrast between two kings. One, the established king, and the one, the anointed king, the true anointed king. And in particular, I see a contrast here in the way of being king. Or the way of going about and doing the kingdom. Or the way of going about and wielding and flexing power for their kingdom goals and kingdom agendas, right? One looks typical. The other one looks strange in some ways. And the question is, which one is which? Well, that's part of the question, right? Okay, but so we got David. And last we left David, he's hiding in a cave. Right? He's literally at rock bottom, no pun intended, <laughs> right? The cave's... Right, that, that's the place where you fled for refuge because you had nowhere else to go in life. Or the caves, as we talked about last week, these are the places where your outlaws and your misfits and those who are cast out of society would run to. Or the caves were literally the place that you went to bury your dead. Right? This is where David is hiding out, initially, all alone in the caves. Saul, on the other hand, is sitting 
on the height. Right? Did you pick it up there? Uh, under the tamarisk tree, with a spear in his hand, his followers in front of him, holding court, as it were. Right? Which one looks more like in a position of power and strength? Uh, David, right, initially he's all alone, but he starts to gather people to him. Right? His family starts coming to him, maybe to be an encouragement to him, but probably more, more likely because it's not safe for them to be at home anymore, too, because right, that's what you did in the ancient world. You eliminated your rival and their families. Right? So they're probably fleeing to David somehow because it's not safe to be home. That's probably why David is taking his mom and dad down to the king of Moab and say, Hey, can they stay with you? Can you protect them for me while I'm waiting on the Lord here? So he's got his family coming to him. And then he's got this interesting band of followers, right? He's got uh, 400 some people rallying to him in, in the caves and out in the wilderness. And the, but, you know, who are they? They're the distressed, they're the indebted. And they're the bitter in soul, <laughs> right? You got all your distressed people, all those who are in debt, all those who are just bitter and frustrated and jaded in soul. This is a, <laughs> a motley crew of new kingdom servants, kingdom followers. And these original bad news bears, you know, or whatever. <laughs> you know, and on the one hand, right, from one angle, you, you look at that and you say, okay, this is kind of sketchy. I don't, you know, I don't know how I feel for David. Now he's surrounded by all these distressed and bitter and indebted people. But on the other hand, uh, you know, one thing you've got to notice is this is a signal in the text that right there, there's your true king. Right? You see the people, you see the guy where all the jaded, embittered, uh, distressed and indebted people are flocking to, right there is your true king. Uh, it's Psalm 72, actually. If you go, go read the whole psalm sometime, but it's, the whole psalm is kind of like a prayer to God that he would preserve the life and the kingdom of the king. So, you know, God, look after your king. Safeguard him. Give him long life. Bless his kingdom. Let his, his renown extend wherever his kingdom goes. Uh, may he have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May all kings bow down before him and all nations serve him. Why? Why, Lord, do you, should you preserve this kingdom and, and uphold this king? Because he delivers the needy when they call. The poor and him who has no other helper. He has pity on the weak and the needy, verse 13, and saves the lives of the needy. From oppression and violence, he redeems their life, and precious is their blood in his sight. That's the prayer of Psalm 72. Hey, preserve your king. Give him long life and a healthy kingdom. Why? Because he looks after the poor, the needy, the distressed, the indebted, the bittered. Point being, this is what it meant to be king in God's kingdom. Right? God's king and his kingdom was never supposed to be one like all the surrounding nations' kings who... You know, it's just surrounded by wives and servants and bakers and, you know, and chefs and lawns keepers. He wasn't ever supposed to be one who had multiple palaces and who had this grand military edifice, right? He was to be one who just, he went after and he safeguarded and he restored life to those whom God's heart was bent towards. The weak, the weary, the poor, the distressed, those who were missing out on the life that God wanted them to live. That's what it meant to be God's king. Right? All to say, a little signal going on in the text here, right? These people were flocking to David, his family, the weary, the distressed, the hurting. And one other thing to point out, who else was coming to David? Did you pick it up? You have Gad, the prophet, and you have Abiathar, the priest. Well, sounds like a bad joke. <laughs> a prophet and a priest walk into a cave. For, you know. but, but what this is, is it signals, right? What's a prophet and a priest? They are signals of God's presence. The prophet is the one who, who speaks on God's behalf. The priest is the one who intercedes on the people's behalf to God and who inquires of God on behalf of the people. In other words, it's just this little reminder or a little indicator in the text that, okay, David's family is coming to him, the weak and the weary and the distressed are coming to him, and God is with him. 
His prophet and his priest are there with David in the cave. They are with David in the wilderness. All right, back over to Saul, sitting under his tamarisk tree up on the height with his spear in his hand. Who's he got around him? He's got around him uh, his, his Benjamites. Benjaminites, I don't know how you say it. All right, Saul's a Benjamin from the tribe of Benjamin, and he's been good to his people. He's been good to his tribe. He's given them lots of perks. He's given them a lot of land. He's given them a lot of vineyards. He's given them a lot of power. He's, make it, he's made them commanders over hundreds and thousands, right? And so he's bought basically himself a team of followers and loyalists, and they're gathered all around him as he's holding court there. And really, the main action in the, in the uh, chapter is here with Saul. And so Saul starts to lay into him. He says, tell me, guys, is that son of Jesse? The name that shall not be named, that son of Jesse, is he uh, giving to you fields and vineyards? Is he making you commanders? Is he giving you power over hundreds and thousands? Such that nobody tells me that my son is conspiring against me. That my son is making covenants with my rival. And that my son is inducing my rival to lay in wait for me. Okay, not true at all. Uh, but Saul, he's so, I don't know, gripped by his fears, his insecurities, his rage. That he doesn't see the world clearly or plainly. So he's convinced that everybody's out to get him. Jonathan clearly is. And you all clearly are conspiring against me because nobody tells me this. And all his followers, you can sort of get the sense of like, ah, don't say anything, just nod your head, so, you know. And the Doeg, the Edomite, who was there with uh, Ahimelech last week, I don't know what he's doing there, but he's the, he's the Edomite. Edomites are a little bit sketchy characters in the Old Testament storyline. He says, I, I'll tell you something, Saul. I saw David come to Ahimelech last week, and, or, or whatever, yesterday, whatever it was, and Ahimelech inquired of the Lord for him. And Ahimelech gave him bread and provisions, and Ahimelech gave him a sword and some, you know, some security weapons, right? Ooh, just like that, Saul says, go get me Ahimelech, and he brings Ahimelech, and he comes to Ahimelech. Why have you, Ahimelech, conspired against me with, with Jonathan and all these people? Why are you conspiring against me that you would give provisions and weapons to David and inquire of the Lord about him? And Ahimelech... Kudos to this guy. He actually has, you know, courage to speak truth to power here. And he says, what, what are you talking about? Who is it that put David in a position of honor in his own household? Who is it that made David his son-in-law? Who is it that made David commander of his own personal bodyguard and sends David out on missions all the time? And I'm inquiring, is this the first time I've had to inquire of the Lord for David as he's sent out on a mission from the king? No. So why would you accuse me of this? Saul, at this point, he's so enraged, he's so, whatever, those chains of fear and insecurity and his lust for the kingdom have him wrapped so tightly that not only can he not see the world clearly, but he's totally, totally immune to sound logic and rationality. I was going to say, I sometimes experience this in my home. I have some young ladies there and in the house and sometimes might get worked up a little angry Callie's staring at me not you Callie <laughs> sometimes get a little worked up and they're angry and I might try to come at them with sound logic and sound reason you know try to dissuade and that never works <laughs> anyway we'll talk about that later but right so he comes to Saul gives him sound reason sound logic and even Saul says nah, no whatever you're going to die for this and so he orders the death of Ahimelech he orders the death of all the priests at Nob his own followers taking a step back, I don't know if out of fear for Saul or fear of the living God, and say, ah, we're not putting a sword to these priests. So he turns to Doeg, he says, Doeg, you do it. Doeg says, I'm on it, boss. And he goes and he slaughters the priests. And then he goes, then Saul sends them into the town. He goes and slaughters every man, woman, child, ox, donkey, sheep, which is kind of ironic, right? Because when God's mercy had run out on the, on the Amalekites and he asked Saul to go execute the ban against the Amalekites, Saul wouldn't do it then. But man, when his fears and his lusts and his insecurities are demanding it of him, boom, he doesn't, doesn't flinch to execute that. 
So it's a horrible, horrifying scene. Uh, one escapes, Abiathar, flees back to David in the wilderness, tells David what happened. David assumes some responsibility for this. And he says this really interesting thing to Abiathar. He says, you know, Abiathar, stay here with me. And don't worry. <laughs> Did you catch this? Don't worry, Abiathar. The guy who's trying to kill you, don't worry. He's trying to kill me too. <laughs> so don't worry about it. <laughs> you know, and Abiathar, oh, okay. <laughs> wait, wait a minute, how am I safe here? The guy's trying to kill me. He's trying to kill you. How am I safe here? And, I, and on the one hand, it looks like a really strange, ironic statement. But on the other hand, you see how this is a profound statement of David's just simple, quiet confidence that God is going to deliver and he's going to save. In other words, I hear in this little statement to Abiathar, what, similar to what David said in defiance to Goliath when he was out on the battlefield. You come at me with your sword and your shield and with your heavy army, armor and whatnot, but I come at you in the name of the Lord, and you're going to die this day, and all the world will know that there is a God in Israel who saves. And I feel like he's saying to Abiathar, hey, Abiathar, don't worry, you're safe. Because there's a God in this cave, or there's a God in this wilderness who saves. Right? And so that's David. Uh, David, he's he's waiting on the Lord, right? It's what he tells the king of Moab. Can you keep my mom and dad while while I wait on what it is God has for me? He's quietly trusting God to save, to deliver, to do whatever he's going to do in his life. And then as a result of that, he's sort of free to offer refuge to the distressed and to the indebted and to the bittered in soul. He's free to, you know, uh, provide care for his family. Hey, you know, let me, let's put you in a place where you're safe. He's pr- free to provide care for, you know, Abiathar. In other words, because he's quietly waiting in the Lord, quietly confident in the Lord, he's not scheming, okay, how do I get into a greater position of strength or security here, right? He's not worried about that, and he's just free to offer refuge, safety, care uh, to those who need it. And the Spirit is present with him. Saul, on the other hand, has been abandoned by the Spirit a long time ago. Saul kicked out of his house any venues of God's mercy. So he's kind of on his own there. His people, he's becoming more estranged from his people. All he has left is pretty much pure, raw fear, insecurity, anger, hatred. And all he can do is wield his power to destroy and to bring death. Okay, but so here's the question I have for you. Let's say you're an Israelite back then. And, you you know, you're just trying to survive in a small village outside the city, out, you know, wherever. And you're looking around, and doggone it, there's these pesky Philistines. And they, they just keep coming, and they just keep coming, and they just seem like they get their kicks out of warfare, and they get their kicks out of just acquiring more land and more servants and more possessions and whatever they can get. And they are masters at building this intimidating weaponry and military, you know, prowess or whatever. And they're always increased encroaching on your home, on your village, on your family, your kids. Okay, so, and you're in that situation, and you're looking out here, and you know, okay, well, we got one king. Well, or, or let me say this, here's the other thing, too, right? As you're looking at these Philistines, you're noticing that their kings are ruthless and powerful, and it seems how they, you know, acquire more of their stuff, right? And so now you're looking out at your kings, and you see Saul, on the one hand, the established king. You see this other guy, David, who rumor has it is God's true anointed king. And you're recognizing, okay, at some point, I'm going to have to align myself one way or the other here. And I got Saul, who, though I don't know if I fully, you know, uh, I like the way he goes about his business, you know, executing all the priests here. But one thing to say about Saul is that man... He wields his power, and he doesn't let anybody get in his way. And when there's any opposition that's coming up, boom, he just deals with them and slaughters them. Uh, And then there's this David who's hiding out in the wilderness, and he's got all these, you know, weak and weary, distressed, indebted, you know, people kind of following around him. Okay, 
and he's always on the run. He can't seem to get a leg up on anything. Who am I going to entrust the life of my family, my home, my village to? I'm looking at David. Ah, I don't know. Well, let's fast forward it. Play that out. Let me ask the same question. Let's say you're an Israelite, you're a Jewish individual in the first century. And you find yourself early on a Friday morning gathered outside Pontius Pilate Courtyard. And, you know, there in the, in the one is, you know, on the one side is this Jesus character who came into town with a lot of fanfare, not to steal some of your thunder for next week, Pastor Tim, but, but uh, came into town with a lot of fanfare. People, you know, rumors that this is, might be the king is going to deliver and they're shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the anointed one. And, and he's standing there on trial, right? And then you're looking, and there's Pontius Pilate. He's the epitome of just raw power that has secured wealth and prosperity and security. And then you got your, your uh, uh, man, I'm getting old. What, what's, what, what are they? Pharisees, thank you. Jeez Louise. Then you got your Pharisees over here, and they're saying, hey, Crucify this Jesus. Look at these Pharisees who are embedded, who are in bed a little bit with the Roman Empire, and they say, "Crucify this Jesus." And you got the crowds of the people that are shouting for Barabbas, this zealot who's skillful with a knife and a dagger. And you're trying to say, "Okay, where do I fall here? You know, what what, what side am I on?" And you know, on the one hand, you hear some you know encouraging things about this Jesus, but then on the other hand, you, you you're evaluating and you take notice that. Well, he certainly doesn't dress like Pontius Pilate. He doesn't look like he's super powerful. Or, you know, I look at who he's hanging out with, and he's hanging out with fishermen and tax collectors and lepers and prostitutes. And, wow, well, you know, I don't know about that. Or, and I started to listen to this Jesus talk, and he's saying things like, you know, blessed are the poor and blessed are the meek and blessed are those who hunger and thirst and suffer for righteousness sake. He's telling us to love our enemies and turn the other cheek and go the extra mile for the Roman centurions who demand that we carry their luggage for them. I don't know. I don't know if I see in this Jesus the one who's going to secure life and peace and prosperity for us here. What kind of king is this? Or just bring it up today into our own world. <laughs> you know, maybe you're like the rest of the culture and you find yourself jaded and cynical, and not trusting anything that's going on. And you're worried about where our culture is going, where our communities and where our neighborhoods are going. You see the rising tide of secularism and the rising tide of just unwise and ungodly, unbiblical ideas, and you worry where this tide is going to sweep you, where it's going to sweep your kids, where it's going to sweep your family. And you're tired of being labeled a bigot or being mocked or ridiculed by the media or whoever because you stand up for what is right and what is good and what is holy. And you... Look in the positions of power, and from your jaded perspective, you see everybody's just ruthless and everybody's tearing down the other, and yet it seems that what that seems to be what getting things done. And at the end of the day, the tide is going to shift by whoever's most in power and whoever can wield the seats of power, whatever. And you wonder, is that the pathway? And meanwhile, there's this Jesus who is a strange king, right? Who says to Pontius Pilate, Look. My, my kingdom is not like the kingdoms of this world because if it was, my people would do what? Right? Fight. Yeah. But my kingdom's not like that. Or this Jesus when he's in the garden and Peter, you know, comes out with the sword and he slices off the ear of the centurion. Jesus picks up the ear, he heals it and almost chides Peter for it. Or this Jesus who chooses crucifixion. You know, and when they're twisting a crown of thorns onto, onto his head and they're driving nails into his hands and spears into his side and then they're standing there and they're spitting at him and they're accusing him and they're mocking him. He's crying out to the Father, forgive them in love. Which king do you follow? 
you know, which way, I guess, look, uh, so, you know, uh, we got we to wrap this up. But I'm saying two things here. First of all, look, if, if you find yourself jaded, <laughs> distressed, embittered in soul, right? If you find yourself, you know, just weary from the hand that you've been dealt in life. Like, I want to point you to Jesus, who never in this life had a thought for himself. Never in this life was plotting and scheming. How do I get into positions of power? How do I get in positions of safety and security? But it was always plotting. How do I bring good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, joy and favor to those who are oppressed? Right? This Jesus who was looking for the opportunities to go and to weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn. This Jesus who was finding every opportunity to go be with sinners, not so that he might heap on them more guilt, more condemnation, but so that he might say to them, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Right? This Jesus who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And if you're jaded, if you're cynical, if you're frustrated, if you're distress, embedded, uh, indebted, man, man, come to Jesus and find for him a respite for your weary soul. And then for the rest of us, like, uh, again, the question is, how do we give testimony? How do we embody? How do we publicly put on display so that everybody sees it? This Jesus, who is that? to a jaded, cynical, weary, indebted, and bitter world. Uh, and uh, for me, uh, it's, it's doing a little bit of what David is doing, right? It's having this quiet confidence in the Lord. It's this quiet waiting on the Lord to lead, waiting on the Lord to provide, being confident that he's the one who saves and he's going to save, right? And out of that confidence, having the freedom then to not be consumed with finding security and power and, and places of safety, but rather can spend himself to take care of those who are in need and to buy respite and encouragement for the weary and the downtrodden and find safety for those who are being persecuted and oppressed, right? But do you see that connection? That's so important. The connection between having a confidence and God's ability to save, confidence in what God has done in Christ, and a quiet waiting on him to provide, to lead, which then leads to the freedom to be able to give yourself in service to others. It gives you the freedom to be like Jesus, who never had a thought for himself, never had a thought about his security, never had a thought about his safety and his peace and prosperity, but was always living to give, not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. That's a high calling. It's a hard calling. But in a cynical, weary, jaded, frustrated world, that's, that's the only way we give real testimony to Jesus is if armed with the confidence in God, we are free to live like Christ. Uh, you know, and I've struggled how to say this at the end, but I'll say it this way. The, my always big concern for the church is that, or one, one big concern I have for the church, is that we become enamored with the way power operates in our world, right? We see the, the raw displays of power. We see the, the ruthlessness. We see the tearing down of all opposition. And the concern would be that we would think that that somehow is the way we secure our life and we secure our church and we secure our, our, our nation. God forbid we ever, we ever believe the insidious lie from the pits of hell that if we want to get this nation back, we want to get our community, our neighborhoods back, we got to stop fighting like two boxers with their hands tied behind your back and fight harder and stronger. It was Jesus who said to Pontius Pilate, my kingdom is not like that, otherwise my people would fight. It was Jesus who chided his disciples when they grabbed the sword and are ready to call down fire from heaven. It's Jesus who chooses crucifixion. It's Jesus who stands up there and when they're spitting at him and thrusting spears into him, has not a thought for himself, but says, Father, forgive them. Right? 
And it's that moment, that's the most powerful demonstration of the kingdom. That's the most powerful advance of the kingdom right then and there. You want to see the kingdom advance? You want to see the church progress and move forward? Don't pick up a spear. Pick up the cross, like Jesus says. Come follow me. Trust me. Wait on me. Let me lead and watch what we're going to do. Right? So like David, let's put our confidence where it rightly belongs. And let's let that lead us in the freedom of being like Jesus. <laughs> willing to sacrifice, willing to give, willing to lay down in love so that a weary, jaded world might see through us and through our testimony this Jesus who saves. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.